didn't really do us very much harm in the first place. It wasn't the flesh, but the dweller in the flesh that was giving trouble, nearly always. The flesh was not, it was the victim. The, uh, the flesh was being scourged daily. It was uh, being constantly beaten like some faithful animal by the ambitious, self-centered driver. So the next thing was to find out what this driving force was. And the moment we do that, we begin to get into the fire principle, which is emotion. Now, emotion uh, is life. The energy behind emotion is magnificent, it's divine. But the use you put to it is miserable in most cases. Emotion is when we get mad, angry, jealous, our ambitions run wild, we don't like people, we don't like things, we can't stand the daily problems of life, and we become beautifully and systematically neurotic. <laughs> so with all these uh, disagreements within ourselves, our emotions are constantly battling us. Um, if the moment we sit down somewhere, a negative thought floats in. Another idea comes along. And always is, there is this temptation, if I'm going to work this hard, what am I going to get for it? And this is where, this is one of the major temptations. Those working truly for the good of the great alchemical mystery are not concerned about what they are going to get for it. They are concerned only with the fact that it is the spiritual and moral necessity of their lives. That it is that for which they were intended in the first place. And the only thing they're going to get for it is release from the, from the absence of it, release from the pain and misery of trying to live without it. So the uh, emotional factor which beats the body, which uses up a very large part of the energy which the body is able to manufacture, is a constant wasting of life. It is a wasting of the divine power. It is the, actually the body uh, being perverted and uh, being mismanaged simply because we want to do what we want to do. Now behind this little mystery and this little problem lies thousands of years of tradition. We have always supposed that when we were unpleasant we had a right to be. We also believed that when we wanted to think something nasty about a person it was our privilege. Or if we wanted to be angry and go into warfare, that was also a right that was inalienable. So out of emotional excess in the, on the personal level are all the temper fits and poutings and psychoses that we most dread. And on the larger world field of the great alchemical retort, this misuse of emotional energy is war, crime, and all the... And all the difficulties that we most fear. So in a small way, we have to heal war by getting rid of our own conflicts, getting rid of our own hurt feelings, our own offenses, getting rid of those things we want to do which we know we can't, and, and the extravagance which demands that we accomplish the incredible or be miserable. We have to get our attitudes and our emotions down where they're reasonable. And we have to use them reasonably and beautifully. One of the best uses, of course, of emotion is art and music and things of this nature. But in the ordinary commonplace of things, it's kindness, it's affection, it's the natural friendliness of human beings. And where this increases strongly, there is a change in body chemistry. The emotions no longer persecute the body. They no longer offer the body on the altar of their own ambitions. They do not destroy. They do not nurse grievances. They waste no time remembering past events. The only thing that we remember from the past is experience which is helping to make us better now. So gradually we relax the emotional content. Now the emotions can be beautiful. And emotions that are beautiful are well worth cultivating. But here again, 
They must be sincere. They must be real. They must be naturally within a pattern of normalcy. Even the best emotion gets into trouble if it becomes hysteria. Then we have to pass on to the next level of this complicated pattern, and that is the mind level. As the emotions sit around making trouble for the body, the mind arrogantly stands up and makes trouble for both. <laughs> it is a, a detriment to the emotions, and it is a further detriment to the body. The mind sets the body in great habits, and these habits are mostly unreasonable. The mind is the final basis of career. It is that which we learn to do well so that we can get rich doing it. Uh, the mind ha is planning forever to make a millionaire out of the body. And the body being unable to stand all that precious, the pressure probably drops dead after the first 10 or 20 million. <laughs> this is the, the problem of the mind also argues and debates. It's the mind that's it's up to Nick in politics, regardless of whether any of the candidates are worth voting for. <laughs> the mind is the basis of telling other people how to live when we don't know how ourselves. And the mind is that which comes to the conclusion that the more we accumulate, the happier we are, when every day this is proven to be an absolute falsehood. So all these problems, the mind has got to be brought down to what it was intended to be, a sort of psychological bookkeeper. The mind is not the master of life, although we have allowed it to become such. The mind is simply a very useful secretary, able to keep the ledgers balanced, and now we're giving in all the minds courses in computerization. But it's going to be a long time before we use these computers to find out what's wrong with ourselves. And we may sometime. It may be someday that we will have to fight it out with the computers, because they may be more right than we are. In any event, however, the mind is a constant cause of agitation. Its ambitions and appetites know no bounds. And it very often it forms a very difficult and unfortunate partnership with the emotions. And when the emotions justify an attitude, there is definitely a bad situation. <coughs> when the emotions fire the mind, that's one problem. When the mind rationalizes the emotions, that can be another. In all these problems, the only answer is gradually to recognize the ascent of the being through these conditions. These are the stories that we have in the great system of the ancient mysteries. The rites of Elysus and Dionysus, the rites of Horus and Isis, the rites of Buddha in India, China, and Japan, were always arranged in three basic steps. And these three basic steps represent the, the three great levels of the personality, that part of ourselves which we have some inkling of but have very little understanding. They have also become the basic blue larger degrees of Freemasonry, and many other uh, fraternal orders have the same trichotomy of rituals and symbols. So the three together uh, constitute what might be termed the visible or tangible temples. In the body, these three powers are, are the grand masters of life. They are the ones upon which merely everyone depends for survival, for continuance, for the fulfillment of purposes. If we can't solve it physically, try to solve it emotionally. If that fails, try to explain it or rationalize it mentally. Then if all of these things fail, we're at a kind of a wit's end. Sometimes we simply drop back and they say there is no answer and return to the more familiar things. And those of a more idealistic nature look upward and see above these three steps something else, perhaps God, that something they still have to transcend more than they have realized was necessary. 
but for our personality and for the experiments of salt, sulfur, and mercury. We have the threefold body and the auric or magnetic field in which it functions. Now, the magnetic field is a very curious thing because it is also a mass of chemical factors. The magnetic field is a constantly changing compound of interactive energies. The, the magnetic field is like a bottle that is being violently shaken after a whole group of materials have been put into it. Now, when we look at the situation symbolically, the magnetic field is a bottle. And it is the bottle that contains the three parts of our own lower nature, each one of which has a magnetic overtone. And when we begin to realize this, we begin to see that we have interactions here as well as in the body. In fact, we have to explain, for instance, why a temper fit will cause a headache or why indigestion uh, will result in serious emotional complexes. The answer is simple. They don't do it that way. The ch troubles arise in the uh, difficulties in the auric or magnetic field due to intemperances of attitudes. If an individual is angry, the magnetic field blazes up and really practically burns out most of the other values, for the moment at least. If the individual is depressed, the magnetic field fades down to a shadow. If an individual is in the presence of contagion and is healthy, the magnetic field can protect him from infection. If, however, he is depleted and goes into the presence of it, he may catch the ailment. So the magnetic field in constant motion, emotion forms, thought forms, and bodily essences make up this particular area. And uh, if there is any deceit, you know, any uh, falseness in the personality, it will show in the magnetic field, although the individual may try to talk himself out of the problem itself. If you have a temper fit and uh, you say it was justified, you are not sure of that because it's not only justified if it does not result in trouble in the magnetic field. The magnetic field is not interested in your excuses. It is not interested in your explanations. It is interested in the chemical interaction of values. When you pervert a value or misuse it, the magnetic field bears witness. And the moment it bears witness, the magnetic field's resources are depleted and the individual does not feel so well. Little by little, abuse of the various emotions, thoughts, and bodily functions will result in the exhaustion of the magnetic fields. And when that exhaustion is complete, the individual simply leaves this world. He cannot function if the energy fields do not sustain him. So uh, it is very important to maintain harmony. And this was one of the great principles of Pythagoras that the world had to be maintained as a musical instrument, that it had to be in harmony always. And the individual in his personal life is also a musical instrument. He is the vena of Shiva, the mysterious instrument that plays the majestic music of life. If he mistakes his destiny or misuses his powers, he is simply in trouble. Now, most of the alchemists got about to the point where they were beginning to sense some of these values. And then they went into a doldrum. Because having gone to as far as the mind could take them, they found themselves at the entrance to the promised land, but they could not enter in. They did not know how to handle that which lies beyond. They had listened carefully. And as Faust in his laboratory, they had read all the great books. They had studied all the mysteries. But there at last they stood with all their lore, fools no wiser than before. Something was wrong. The great search ended in a frustration, not in a great reward which they had hoped for. Now, the uh, only answer to this was to do what 
Lully and Valentine and Coonroth and many others did, and that is check over what has happened, what did happen. Why is this sudden block that is um, impossible for most people to get through? And the final decision was that this block was the absence of a faculty higher than the mind. The mind could only go a certain distance. Even though it's the most beautifully trained mind, it could not fulfill the ultimate. There has to be something higher than the mind, without which the great experiment cannot be performed. Now, in alchemical parlance, uh, when Elias Artista visited the alchemist, he sometimes gave him a small amount of the transmuting powder. powder. He put it in his ring, or he made a tiny little vial which was worn around the neck, and one grain of this powder would transmute a thousand times its own weight into solid gold. Well, there was a lot of talk about that, uh, but the grains were few. But it was known that in some cases they were. It is believed that Roger Bacon offered to finance the Crusades for, Greek, for, for, the, for England as a result of the ability to transmute base metal into gold suitable to be minted. All these legends and fables go on, but the main story of the thing seems to be that Elias Artista, or one like him, uh, appeared at the proper moment to give some type of instruction, something more uh, than the alchemist alone had achieved. The Elias never occurred or never appeared unless the disciple was in every way worthy. He would never help any alchemist out of his own mistakes but he would help him to progress beyond a sincere effort to a greater degree of accomplishment. And of course, in the alchemical tradition, there were seven stages of, of adepts and masters relating to the science. Therefore, it was a long journey at best, but it was also a journey which every step brought with it a greater sense of inner security and sincerity. With the uh, beginning of the fourth step, uh, under the leadership of a guide, or by means of this mysterious tincture, the uh, alchemist received his first evidence that he was going to ultimately succeed. He received the inner message that the uh, labor was not in vain. It was from a hope in the first three to a kind of mysterious, mystical certainty in the fourth level that made it possible for him to go on. So this fourth level was uh, found, and of course uh, we find in uh, alchemy, the life of Christ is an alchemical formula. We also find, according to the Kabbalists, that the uh, Song of Solomon is also purely a chemical formula in disguise. But the Christian formula of, of the uh, Christ mystery places Christ as the final achievement of the universal medicine. And in the alchemical symbols, figures of Christ, also of other saints, appear in the bottles to indicate that this was the intention of the story, although most people didn't realize that fact. So in the fourth step, we come to the next thing, and that is the beginning of an integrated mystical experience. In other words, the fourth step was the awareness of the soul. It was what uh, in Indian philosophy uh, is the buddhic state. It is the state of the individual suddenly becoming rational inside himself, achieving a sense of reality superior to thought, and also becoming for the first time capable of directing his own efforts by the very divine power within him which he was seeking to release into manifestation. So in the ancient Hermetic mysteries, the soul was the symbol of the 
Elias Artista, the adept. It was the one power in man capable of becoming the internal instructor, the capable of becoming the source of inner enlightenment that cannot fail. Now, in the, uh, in the system of the alchemy, the cultivation of this soul power is perhaps most clearly defined in the writings of Bami, the German theologian mystical shoemaker, who was one of the greatest mystics of the Protestant world. Bami was the one who finally realized that within himself was the adept. The adept was not somebody wandering around outside. The adept was the adept self, uh, more or less in the same spirit of, uh, of the uh, leadership that we find in the psychology of Carl Jung, where the teacher, the inner teacher, becomes the symbol of the master alchemist. In this particular phase of the subject, light begins to shine from within. Light begins to clarify things. Uh, the eye begins to see through the blind spot in its center. The world becomes more and more translucent. The elements become more and more understandable. And instead of seeing nothing but bodies, the intuitive mind gradually learns to see nothing but qualities. And the intuition, intuitional mystical experience is one in which the individual looking at things sees them as they are and not as he has thought them to be. He sees the rock and the stone and the star, not as he does with mortal eyes, but from an inner vision which projects a higher level of sight. In other words, to make it a little clearer, all things that exist have not only the visible forms of their existence, but the invisible forms. Each rock and pebble, each twig and flower, is not only a physical thing, but a metaphysical thing. With the mind, emotions, and bodies, we see the physical thing, we pick them up, and we make a bouquet of flowers. With the psychic power of the soul, we see the psychic bodies of these things. We see the magnetic fields of them. We become aware of their degree of growth in uh, the development of their potential. We also become able to watch clearly the result of combining them. We see the compatibilities and incompatibilities. We see the elements that work together and the works that cannot be reconciled. So little by little, as we work with the soul eye, we become aware of the universal soul. For the first time, we are capable of seeing the quality of life. Uh, this is... Uh, well noted in some of the early visions of the Platonic writers and uh, many other mystics who were able to behold the invisible shapes of things and in seeing their shapes beholds their natures for while the physical body cannot change greatly the psychic centers within the body are in constant motion and constant agitation it is also then also possible for the alchemist to discover something that perhaps he has never fully realized before. He may have believed it, but believing and knowing are two different things. He knows, for example, that no matter where he turns or what he looks toward or what he examines, there is nothing in the entire universe that is not alive. Even the grain of sand is a living mystery. Everything is alive. And in the great aliveness of things, the magnetic fields of all these different forms gather in the magnet magnetic atmosphere of the universe. It is a very great and important subject for careful study. But in any event, with the beginning of this dimension of value, the alchemist begins to discover how to accomplish the mutations which are necessary to his art. He knows the principle of sublimation. He knows the cycles of recapitulation that have to be used because gradually he sees that alchemy is only a symbolic representation of the entire process of universal activity. Everything is part of the same great pattern. 
and this pattern unfolds as we become capable of understanding it. The pattern is never more nor less, but our relation to it is forever changing as a result of personal growth. A disillusionment or a frustration, these leave scars in this great pattern, but in the course of things we go on in any event to that which is necessary to us. As a result of the uh, development of the soul cycle uh, factor, we are reminded of Nicolas Flamel, a Schreiner in France, who became an alchemical adept. He and his wife, Cornella, both worked together and finally accomplished the projection. Then what did uh, the, the good man do? Flamel simply took the, all that he had made with all of his arts and with all of his struggles and dedicated it to the building of churches and the service of the poor. And uh, in the ch uh, Yard of the Innocents in Paris, uh, his Church of the Innocents stood for centuries, but was finally destroyed during the Revolution. When I was in Paris last time, I tried to find the, where the church had been. I finally found the Square of the Innocents, now a little park, but no building. And in the yard of the uh, Musée Plumet in Paris are stones from the ancient church. And this church was ornamented on the outside with the hieroglyphics of the achievement of the great work. But the whole process was based upon the simple fact that uh, Flamel had dedicated everything that he learned every advancement in knowledge simply to the relief of suffering. He had no intentions of profiting by it himself. This is probably why he was one of the greatest of the European adepts and why after he was supposed to have, been die, have died he simply retired into the Near East where he was seen centuries later. But in any event when you get to this level you begin to work with the chemistry and alchemy of life it is no longer little materials in bottles. It is vast concepts experienced within the unfolding massiveness of human projection. Little by little, the entire mystery goes on until finally it, the individual, from an intuitive procedure, forms a reunion with the divine part of himself. And having made this union with the divine part of himself, he then goes on to the further steps of the great transmutations. He finds himself gradually lifted up into the hierarchies of life. But never, however, for personal gain, never for glory, never for wealth, and never to escape pain. These things are processes of growth, and the pains and sufferings that we have are the impairments which by our own policies we know no better. It is not a fall. It is one of those things that nature has presented to us for contemplation and which we must face whether it is happy or not. But in going on and on, we gradually find the heart of alchemy in the great universal plan of things. We find that the planet itself is in a state of constant alchemical transformation. We know that the solar system is moving from one level of evolution to another. We know that the whole cosmos is coming in more and more into perfect harmony with its own rules. These different forms of life, therefore, we find, have a tendency, as time goes on, uh, to be absorbed into higher forms of life. It isn't that sometime that our planet will simply disappear or go forever and we will cease because of it. It simply means that evolution is a growing. And when we outgrow the experiences that we are facing in the 20th century, we will no longer be subject to the confusion and sorrow of these experiences. We have to solve problems. And the alchemist problem was to solve the mystery of himself. He had to find ways to outgrow his own limitations. And uh, various systems have been in advance for that. Religion has attempted exactly the same thing. Philosophy has attempted it. 
science will someday attempt it because science will have instruments by means of which many of the great mysteries of antiquity can be solved. But regardless of the motive behind it or the methods used, the whole answer is the gradual transformation called transmutation, multiplication, and finally projection of the great work. This uh, is a sort of a, a marvelous wonder world of forces and values which work together in the music of the spheres, as was Pythagoras called it. A universe of infinite integrity, infinite beauty, and infinite wonder. A universe which exists within ourselves as a potential of all of these things. For there is nothing in the universe that is necessary to man that he does not possess. And it is perfectly possible to conceive the ultimate unity of man and the universe. Not by him ceasing to be himself, but by outgrowing what he has come to consider himself, which is another pretty little problem that we all have to face. We all think of ourselves as we are. We think of ourselves looking in the mirror and seeing exactly what we are. We look in and we see a face that is fairly reasonable. That, that's pretty good. If it's too unreasonable, we try to do something about it. We look around us, we see our clothing, we see our friends, we see our associates, and we see ourselves as a kind of creature, just as we are. And with the mental and emotional levels of vision, we see the inside the way we think it is. For the outside, we have to depend on x-ray. But on the other phases of it, we look inside and we see ourselves as a more or less complicated mass of conflicts and contradictions. We realize that we have nothing to brag about if we want to be really honest about it. But we always can think of something to brag about. And uh, all these infirmities, weaknesses, uh, limitations, we take for granted. The individual is what he is. He's going to be here a little while, then he's going to leave. Where he's going, no, most people aren't very sure. But in any event, we take this selfness as it is to be ourselves. This selfness is the thing we've given the name John Doe to. And whenever someone says John Doe, we stand up. We recognize ourselves by these forms utterly and completely. We recognize ourselves as a separate entity somewhere in the world of creatures. And it never occurs to the average person that there is any real reason why he should be anything else except what he appears to be. There's no reason why he should give up all his pleasures for something he doesn't understand. There's no reason to assume that he could ever be any more than he is. Science is very doubtful about that thinks he might in the course of millions of years uh, become an animated computer, but there's no proof of that. We just don't know, but we assume that as we are is it. So it's from that standpoint that we are locked in the lowest level of achievement. But the only other answer seems to be to try to make as it is as comfortable as possible. We don't want to suffer more than we have to. We do not want to do anything that is going to inconvenience us. We want to go along as well as we can until we leave. Well, this, of course, is a lack of aspiration. And there has to be some aspiration or nothing works. Therefore, it becomes very necessary for the individual to sense that there is something more that he can become or he will stay the way he is. No amount of education can get him out of it because education can only help the mind, but the mind cannot get at the fact. So out of growth, out of friendship, kindness, experience particularly, we have to gradually release the soul power, uh, the over-self of Emerson. We have to release this inner superiority and give the best of ourselves immediately the rulership over the rest of ourselves. Plato said that in the philosophic, philosophic empire, the wisest lead, and those not so wise are still wise enough to follow honorably. To the uh, individual, the best part of himself must be the leader of the rest. 
For the moment he rests leadership upon any contaminated level of his own consciousness, he is in trouble. So he tries to go along the best he knows. But uh, the alchemist was a kind of a being apart, a natural mystic. And there have been many mystics that were not alchemists, but were also on the same general level. There is a part of society, it's a small part, unfortunately, that has discovered within itself the need for growth, the need to become more, that there are certain nagging questions that we need to answer in order to live well now. And we also have to mo know more about more before we can get along with the little that we do know. Gradually we have to increase in all these values in order to make life in this world suitable to us. We have to try and find the answers to war and corruption. We realize that as we are now, even though we may never be in a war ourselves, we are in a war with, and conflict with our neighbors and our families and within the biological structure of our own bodies. Therefore, something has to be done to arbitrate these things. So the way of arbitration is a slow process of discipline by means of which we ascend through the three personality factors of our lives and come into harmony with the fourth level, which in the ancient astronomy was the level of the sun, the fourth orbit. Then we have to take the body and the, and the psychic or the soul and wed them in what the alchemists call the marriage of the sun and moon. All of these things are interesting experiences and philosophical thoughts, but out of them come certain simple things. Alchemy is nothing more or less than a dedicated effort to find out where we came from, why we're here, and where we're going. It is also a science by which all sciences built in selfishness can be rededicated to the common good of humanity. It is a way of applying all that we know to all that the problem of the problems that we must solve. Gradually, step by step, we become more knowing, more useful, and more helpful. And we become better citizens here, and whether we realize it or not, we're better citizens of eternity. So the alchemical symbolism is, is a lovely metaphysics. It is a gracious and beautiful approach to one of the great problems of daily existence. And every individual in his own personal life can be an alchemist. He can be a worker with the divine chemistries of living. He can work with the chemistry of adjustments with society. He can work in disciplining his own nature. He can develop integrity and, and kindliness and gradually transmute his life from a self-centered effort to succeed into a soul-centered effort to serve the great cause of life. As these changes take place within himself, he will find that he is gradually being transmuted. He is being changed from a mortal creature to a divine being, which was always there, always within him, but which was locked by the limitations of what we might term natal ignorance, the ignorance of a, a life growing up that has to grow to know, has to develop its own potentials in order to be able to learn and which, one way or another, by the problems of life, will ultimately be impelled to dedicate itself to the search for that which it needs to know. If we put all these things together and work them out, we will be, I think, uh, good alchemists, good mystics, good Christians, and good followers of the great ethical principles of the world. I'll thank you very much.